Some say the most important day in the history of personal computers occurred about six years ago when IBM introduced the original IBM PC. Since then, we've seen the XT, the AT, hundreds of clones, but it was this original IBM PC which set the standard. Today, IBM is trying to establish a new standard with a second generation of personal computers, the Personal System 2. Will this be a major event in personal computing history or just another new product introduction? We'll try to get an answer to that question today as we take an analytical look at the Personal System 2 computers from IBM on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 and 2400 baud modems. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Leading Edge, leading the way to the information age. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, this is the new IBM Model 50, part of its new line of personal system 2 computers. There's been so much talk about the new IBM machines, people wondering how important a new product introduction this really is. Is it as important as the original IBM PC and so on? I want to ask you, what do you think? Is this exciting new technology, or is it really repackaging existing technology? Well, IBM was forced to repackage some of the technology to be compatible with the old ATs. But in fact, there are a lot of really interesting things that have been added to it. We have graphics mouse support, the microchannel architecture. That means we're going to see some really interesting, colorful business applications. We're going to see uh, good multitasking, networking okay. support. And in fact, if you want to take a look at the whole line, it's covered right from the low end all the way up to the scientific workstations with the Model 80. So in general, I'm very impressed with the whole line. Gary, we're going to take a look at the Personal System 2 computers today. We'll talk to journalists, analysts, and consultants to see what they think about the new IBM machines. And we'll get to play with one, take it apart, and see what it can do. First of all, what do consumers think about these new IBM computers? We talked to several computer retailers to find out what kind of feedback they're getting. It was the biggest IBM product announcement since the original PC. And if the PS2 line didn't frighten the clone makers, it has brought a wide spectrum of potential buyers into computer stores with differing reactions. First time customers in the first week the machine was here um, were curious, would be the correct word. You know, curious about the smaller disk drives, curious about the uh, displays, and the, the changes you know, from the traditional IBM PC, which has been around for a long time. Um, business customers, though, have seemed to have caught right on to the Model 50s and 60s, and they're selling um, quite nicely. Lots of inquiries and lots of sales right away. So there seems to be an acceptance, which we had some doubts about, by small business. The smaller footprint and better graphics of the new machines seem to attract the most favorable comments. But some nagging questions about software availability have yet to be answered. Some of the customers are real concerned about the vaporware and some of the software that's not available at this point and a lot of them want to have and touch and feel the products before they actually say I want to buy. They want to see it and experience it before they actually go out and acquire the products. Whatever effect the operating system 2 delay has on sales, IBM's marketing plans appear to be a big hit with dealers. Restricting the number of sales outlets keeps profit margins up, and the training program is comprehensive. What they're doing with the personal system, too, is, is retraining the whole staff, technical and sales, in a timely manner. So, for example, by the end of this month, our whole sales staff will be trained at two day and more seminars, and some of them have already been trained. And that's particularly uh, fast for such a new product. Joining us in the studio now is Tony Harris, Director of Graphics Marketing for Digital Research, and next to Tony is Ron Kaufman, Technical Consultant with RX Computers in Oakland. Gary. Tony, uh, you and the GEM group had quite a bit of experience with the PS2 during the uh, porting of the GEM applications. What is your impression of the machine overall? 
Well, this is definitely in the machine for the end user, no question. Um, basically, right out of the box, the end user has very few cables to plug in. Everything's clearly marked, very simple. Um, graphics are on the board, so no, ca no uh, boards to plug in, as much memory as he needs, and a high resolution graphics, 640 by 480 resolution and 16 colors, and mm -hmm. away he goes. Ryan, what about from your perspective? You're a kind of frontline guy here who works with users. You've been working in the AT world primarily. What do you think about these machines? Well, I, I walked out of the IBM press conference. I had two striking impressions. Uh, one is that they, they upped the ante for, uh, they, they created the microchannel architecture, which is uh, a wonderful uh, compilation of all the improvements that have happened over the last five or six years mm -hmm. to the original PC. They did, a, they did a nice job of that, and they've made it uh, very much easier for, for third-party vendors and IBM themselves to make further improvements to this machine. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be around uh, probably as long as the original PC, four or five years. And, uh, and, I, and, and the, the second impression is that commitment to open architecture. I think there's no question that, mm -hmm. that they stated that very firmly. Right. Tony, one of the wraps in the old IBM PCs has been in the world of desktop publishing, which is a very hot application now. Right. It really hasn't been a very friendly machine in that environment. Have they, have they really solved the problems of the PS2, a good desktop machine? I think so. Um, basically, the high resolution capability of the machine, 640 by 480, is now standard, mm -hmm. and the monitor that comes with it is able to handle that straight away. Mm -hmm. um, you really need that kind of resolution to be able to display text and uh, fonts on the screen, and also with the power of the processor, the two combine now to really give you a superb desktop publishing solution. Mm -hmm. Now, working with Jim, of course, you've come out now with a desktop publisher. Absolutely. And I might mention, Gary, this is, of course, your product and your, your company. Microsoft isn't the only software That's company right. working That's with right. IBM. You, in fact, were one of 10 companies, I think, that IBM had as part of the, uh, the That's press That's correct. Conference. We were real happy to be a part of that. <laughs> Show us how a desktop publisher from Jim, for example, runs on the Model 50. Okay, well, we're seeing the 640 by 480 16 color resolution of the machine at the moment, and this is the GEM desktop publisher application. What I can do here is we, we're showing the text. What I can do is drop a rectangle in here, much as you might see a rectangle on your uh, paper at home, and uh, then I can just simply uh, select graphics here. We'll pull in a map of desktop publishing usage across the USA. Mm -hmm. I can then to go to a full page mode, and here we can really see the resolution of the machine coming into play, the speed of the processor, really combining to uh, let me lay out my printed page and even add more graphics in, and uh, then see how the text wraps around and we can bring in a pie chart. So here what we have is high resolution combined with speed, combined with a really easy to use application, all working hand in hand for a desktop publishing mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. Ron, when you, when you see this, is the AT a kind of obsolete machine now? I don't think it's obsolete at all. I, I, I really believe that, uh, well, first off, most of the technology here can be added into an AT, as we already know. Mm -hmm. uh, what the AT doesn't have, it doesn't, it's not the standard for the future. Um, I, I believe it will run. It's allegedly going to run OS2. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the talked about presentation manager, I'd like to know if Tony has actually seen that yet. Uh, which I think is, is uh, as we've seen from the Macintosh, is going to be the way that programs will be written mm -hmm. in the future. Um, so it's, while, it, while it's not obsolete, as a matter of fact, there's some very, very good buys in the AT world right now. You can, you can buy an <laughs> AT for about $2,000, and, uh, and that's quite a deal. Uh, if, you, if you have that need, uh, you can probably beef it up to yeah. this. Uh, for about the same price range. Ron, you brought up OS2, Operating yeah. System 2, which is the new operating system somewhere down the line. Alleged. Alleged <laughs> operating system, 1988 and beyond. Uh, let me ask you guys, you're involved obviously in that world. How much of a handicap is it right now, do you think, to these machines that everybody's going to sit around and wait for the new operating system and the new power of the machines, particularly at the Model 80 end? Well, of course, the way I'd answer that is that there is already an operating system from Digital Research, in fact, which runs on both the 286 and the 386 uh, systems in the full-up protected mode, and that is in Flex, uh, Flex OS. That's mm -hmm. our operating system, and that's available today. Of course, as operating system 2 comes online, then our current GEM applications will move into that and remain compatible with it, indeed, as yeah. with Flex OS as well. well. What about DOS 3.3? Is that any major improvement? Well, it's not a major improvement, but it is clear that DOS 3.3 is going to be the productivity tool operating system for the next couple of years. I, I think it's much less clear that OS2 is going to be the, uh, the operating system mm -hmm. of choice for multi-user, multitasking operations. Um, I thought it was significant on the day of the, of the IBM press conference that Microsoft showed Xenix 386, for example. Mm -hmm. I, thought it was, uh, I, I, I thought it was also significant that, that they flashed AIX in front of, in back of Bill Lowe. And I, I wonder what all these things mean. You know, they're, they're telling us about OS2. 
um, I'm not quite sure it's mm. going to be there. Well, I think the real important thing is that it brings multitasking, multi-user systems to the forefront in terms of the, right. uh, the mentality. People are thinking yeah. about that now. It's not single-threaded single systems that we saw, we've mm. seen for exactly. years and years. And uh, I think that's really the most important part of that. Sure. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We're going to have two of the top journalists in the industry here in just a minute and find out what they think about the personal system to computers, so stay with us. With us in the studio now is John Dvorak, contributing editor with PC Magazine, and next to John David Bennell, editor-in-chief of PC World Magazine. John, you and David have been commenting on the IBM PC world for uh, well, as long as I can remember. Uh, what are your impressions about the inter introduction of the system, personal system too? It's a sort of new, what do they call it, the uh, new platform, I guess? It's easy, it's <laughs> right. easy for you to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 I like the size of the thing, that's one thing for sure, and the uh, engineering inside is unbelievable, it's just fantastic, but the performance of the machine, except for the hard disk, it has a special cache that allows it to run a lot faster, or effectively faster, even though it's a slow hard disk. Uh, the performance of the machine is really a couple of years old, it's nothing particularly outstanding, in fact, this screen that we've got here, as, is, uh, which shows a benchmark running, um, and it shows the machine running effectively at 9.8 megahertz, obviously not using weight state, it's got one weight state memory, which is kind of old fashioned. Uh, <laughs> the uh, screen is blurry, uh, there's a lot of little idiosyncratic things, it's a closed architecture, even though the <laughs> other guest says it's open, it's open in a certain way, but IBM threatens to sue anyone for patent violation if they use it. And, uh, I'm, you know, a little disappointed, actually. Okay, so you sound pretty negative, but how about you, David? Uh, well, I think it, at least the mystery about what IBM is going to do has been removed, and I think these machines are going to do very well in Fortune 1000 companies where people have mainframes, but I don't think they're machines that people will lust after. And I think that if you look at the history of the personal computer and the machines that have truly been successful, including the original PC, the people really lusted after those machines. They had to have them. It was a big deal to have one of these machines on your desk, the PC, the Mac, the Apple II earlier. And I think the Mac II probably fits in that category. But I don't see anything here that I would lust after. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, uh, just following up on that one question about uh, patent uh, items in the machine itself, does that mean that we're not going to see clones in the new personal system too? Well, when I talk to all the manufacturers of the clones, uh, they all tell me two things that are interesting. One is that they're spending most of their time, and we've invited a new person into the CEO realm of the clone maker, which is the lawyer. <laughs> They're spending all their time, the lawyers are poring over these things, trying to figure out where there's, if it's a patent violation here and there, and whether they can even make cards. We're not even sure you can make cards. You, nobody knows, so they're going to spend, figure in the next six to nine months trying to figure that out. Um, Do we need clones? Is a yeah, that's the other well, way. Uh, actually, yeah, that is a question. <laughs> but I think when we start talking about machines two or three years from now, when we want to go to real fast CPU speeds and 386s, it might be nice to use this bus because it's a real real nice bus, but uh, well, the software runs on both the clones and this machine, and IBM is going to bring us some proprietary software that probably won't be too exciting if they go by past performance, so uh, I don't see why there's even really that much concern. I don't, I'm not too worried about the clones uh, well, let's, cloning let's this machine. Let's go back to David's comment about do you need clones. Why, why do you say that? Do you think we can get along without clones? Well, there are already machines on the market that perform as well as these machines, mm -hmm. and uh, the OS2 operating system, when it comes out, is really transportable to other bus mm -hmm. architectures, so it's not clear that the market really needs to clone the IBM bus. Uh, perhaps other people will come up with different solutions. John, one of the things I think you do like about this machine is how quickly you can take it apart in its kind of modular design. Can I ask you to sort of shut it down and... Yeah, we're going to see what... Do uh, that for me there. It the does turn off. <laughs> I don't think they like this switch in the front, by the way, although some people think it's a good idea. It okay, turns we'll out that uh, it will just uh, allow people to accidentally turn it off easier. Take this little three-and-a-half-inch disc out. Most of the uh, components of this uh, machine if you if you know what you're doing here, slide slide out, and uh, things pop out. This this is kind of interesting. They've got this. Uh, you sure it pops out? Yeah, time. they all pop out. It's just what's interesting about this particular. <laughs> <laughs> like to get this little <laughs> button here, you know. Oh, there it is. This okay, is the tool that I didn't use <laughs> to pop these things out. There's a little tool here, and you can pop out all these little little rivets. There's a rivet here. Let me get this thing out of here. 
Well, anyway, so you really can, is a kind of a rector. This is normally approach. a piece of cake. I can see how easy this is to get. Yeah, no, this is real simple to pop out here. We just pop this sucker out here. Well, let's see. Well, normally this thing <laughs> just pops right out. It's very easy to do. I, I, I seem to be missing a uh, couple of these little bolts down here that normally uh, people don't think that these little bolts are going to last very long. But that's the only problem. Those little plastic things that keep it all together. Yeah. So, I think you're getting closer. Yeah, I am. I'm missing. Up oh, there it is. Okay. David, while he's messing around. <laughs> oh, you got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then this hard disk like slides right out and you can pop a new one. You got in. more bolts to pump in there, I think is, is a problem there. Yeah, no, those are all this the, is uh, really fun for people that like to take their computers <laughs> apart and put it back together. I think it's a big, ticker to big market for that. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a serious question. I mean, what's the point, John? I mean, you like this, but I mean, is it important that you can pop all these things? Well, out? no, what it really means is that a service guy can come into a big company. They figure they're going to spend 25% less in service contracts. I mean, it'll cost 25% of what a service contract currently costs because you can come in, pop the hard disk out, pop the speaker out, pop this board out, you can pop anything out, pop it back in almost instantaneously, and, and the machine will be at, uh, up and running Fix again. It and real fast and big companies yeah. need that. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think these machines are really nicely targeted to large corporations. The uh, question is will they make an impact in small business yeah. and education and medium sized companies? And that's not too clear yet. Dude, what is your overall impression of the pricing, uh, how it compares with the rest of the machines that are out there now? Well, people are saying that uh, they're amazed that the IBM at pricing seems to be pretty high. But traditionally in the computer business, you start out with a high price and you can come down under it. And we know that the manufacturing costs of this machine are about 40% less than the traditional line of PCs. So IBM could lower the price significantly mm -hmm. at a point when they need to do that. Gentlemen, we have about a minute left. Uh, briefly, what's the good and the bad here of the personal system to computers? John? Well, I think the good is is that it's a, it sets a new standard for engineering. Uh, there's no cables in this thing, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. And there's nothing worse than these old machines. They've got cables all over the place. You pull the cover off, jerks a bunch of cables out. It's a real mess. Uh, this is just a very nice, it could be built by robots. Uh, and uh, it's it's very state of the art kind of uh, architecture inside uh -huh. in terms of the engineering and design. I like that. And it's small and lightweight. Okay, David? Yeah, I think what's significant is the new operating OS2 system and breaking through the 640K barrier, which isn't out yet, but once it's out, it will allow us to have new categories of software and we'll finally have multitasking and mm -hmm. be able to do some interesting You're things. You're satisfied that's for real? I'm satisfied it's for real, but I'm not sure when it will come right. out. That's a big question. Gentlemen, you can continue to play there, John, if you <laughs> yeah, like. Thank you very much. Down, take it home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in so just a minute them. with Jan Lewis and George Morrow, so stay with us. United Airlines runs one of the world's largest computer systems, the Apollo Reservation Systems, with 8,000 users, some 38,000 terminals. The good news for IBM is that United was the first corporate buyer of the personal system to computers, with an order for 40,000 Model 50s. The Model 50s will replace existing terminals on United's massive computer network. The Apollo Reservation System runs off eight IBM mainframes using 460,000 miles of communication circuits. The system can handle 1,500 transactions a second. Despite the fact that many of the existing terminals on the system are PCs or ATs, they are essentially dumb terminals with all applications coming from the centralized system. One reason United decided to go with PS2 computers was its desire to get into a more distributed architecture. As we move forward in a distributed architecture, we're looking to provide our users with the ability to develop and support their own level of applications over time and not depend on us as a single source for all of their future enhancements. United chose the Model 50 computers after concluding that they offered the best price-performance combination in the new PS2 line. The Model 50s will become an integral part of United's new focal point reservation system, which brings new enhancements to the Apollo network. Among the improvements are a menu-driven system which replaces cryptic codes with natural language commands, 
The net result is an up to 80% reduction in the number of keystrokes required to use the system. United is also and using the Microsoft Windows crop. environment Very so that reservations agents can now no look at several aspects of a client's record at the same time, saving time and allowing for better service. Another benefit of the distributed architecture is locally controlled utilities such as calendar, calculator, online Rolodex, and even a word processor. Despite the use of PS2 personal computers on the United Reservation system, United will not be making focal point available to PC users via an online service. If you saw the movie War Games and saw a kid sitting on a PC at home and booking a round the world trip with no risk transference, he didn't buy anything, he just booked it. He's tying up live inventory. And from our perspective, from the airline perspective, that inventory is sacrosanct. Once you sell it, you can't get it back. And unless somebody physically gives you a credit card number or pays you for it, you have nothing. United's decision to buy 40,000 IBM Model 50s is a major commitment to the personal system, too, and the IBM standard. But Barry Kotar says the machines justify their confidence. To say that we're very impressed would be an understatement. Its communications connectivity, its networking capabilities are unsurpassed. Uh, long term, the overall costs of maintenance and ongoing support of those devices, we believe, will more than pay for themselves. So uh, we believe that IBM has, has developed a machine that will set the standard for the next five years that the others will have to play against. With us in the studio now is Jan Lewis, president of the Palo Alto Research Group and publisher of Jan Lewis's Computer Insider. And next to Jan, George Morrow, a computer pundit at right now chief scientist for Nestar. Jan, in introducing this new machine line, IBM has uh, really introduced a whole uh, sales and service policy. Uh, the dealers themselves have to have training for the end user, the customer. What does this mean in terms of the new presentation of materials to consumers themselves? Well, for the consumers, they're going to be getting a higher level of support from the dealers than they were on the first generation of PCs. Mm -hmm. uh, what IBM really is doing is taking the kind of support they have provided to the mainframe users for many years and moving that level of support through the third parties, meaning the dealers, the borrowers, the retailers, to the end user. So it really won't be up to the end user to install boards and try and figure out, go through manuals and, and determine for themselves how to run these machines then. They will not have to do it, and if they did do it, it would be easier. Yeah. Well, okay. I, and I think John DeVore showed us how IBM's managed to make that an awful lot more practical than they did in the mainframe days. They can afford it now. Mm -hmm. They can give a level of service uh, virtually impossible before. Uh, George, what is your feeling about the clone, clone issue? Well, I have to disagree with the fellows about clones. I think there are going to be a lot of clones. And, and the main reason they're going to be clones isn't so much in processing power. Anybody can buy processing power now. You can get an Amiga with nice processing power. But it's the I.O. bus that IBM has brought to the game now, and a very uh, much more enhanced bus than it used to be. It will go to 32 bits. And while the rest of the clone makers have been struggling and agonizing over how to move to 32 bits, IBM now has done it. And I think the other people that make machines in the desktop area are going to have to follow that mm -hmm. lead. Jan, what about uh, operating system two, multitasking and so on? For instance, we hear Apple right mm -hmm. now is working on its multitasking software for the new mm -hmm. Macs and so on. Uh, what's going to happen there? Is Apple going to beat IBM to the punch, you think, with this? Well, I'm not sure that it matters whether somebody beats someone else by six months or not, because it's going to take many years for the software really to develop. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been many years that really that we've been promised yeah. multitasking operating systems. When it does happen, and when we do have that couple of years of development, I think the user is never going to want to go backwards, mm -hmm. never going to want to go back to the original kind of operating environment that they have mm -hmm. had. The amazing thing to me on the operating systems is that for now, going on three years, there's a huge gap between the address ability of these machines, at least on the IBM side, and what the operating systems can handle. And somebody has dropped the ball marketing and not coming in and filling the gap between that, the, the ability of the processor and the ability of the operating system. Well, you know, it's, uh, we've had a lot of experience with multitasking operating systems in the past, mm -hmm. and once people have changed over and used those kinds of operating environments, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible to go back mm -hmm. to single threads. Well, that's true. You have mm -hmm. to be very careful about the way you move them forward. But I think that uh, what's happening in this marketplace is something that none of us expected a few years ago. You know, I, used, I was the first guy who said it was crazy to have a soft drink salesman running a computer company. 
but uh, <laughs> it turned out that marketing is a yeah. very important issue in this place, in this marketplace, and it's going to become more important. And I think if there's a deficiency in the marketing of the operating systems or the problems of the operating system is not is marketing and not technology. Jen, George, thank you very much. That's it for our look at the new IBM Personal System 2 computers. Stay tuned. We'll have this week's computer news in just a minute. In the random access file this week, Lotus says it's finally dropping copy protection on 123 after years of complaints from users. The new release 3.0 will be copyable. The clone makers may finally be ready to close in on the personal System 2 computers. Phoenix Technologies, makers of PC-compatible ROM BIOS software, has released eight new products, including several that work with the Intel 8386 chip. Hewlett Packard has announced five new PC-compatible products, including HP's first 386 product, the Vectra RS PC. HP also introduced a new entry-level Vectra called the CS PC. It's priced at only $1,195. Apple says it's working on the company's first laptop computer. No definite plans for a product release yet, but company spokesmen say Apple has built about a dozen prototypes. San Francisco was the site of this year's annual Apple Fest. Steve Wozniak was the keynote speaker. Several new products were unveiled, including Broderbund's new Jam Session software for the Macintosh. There were several low-end desktop publishing packages for the Apple II, and Applied Engineering finally showed off its PC Transporter package that lets you run IBM software on an Apple II. A Chicago teenager did a bit too much bragging on a bulletin board, and the hacker, known as Shadowhawk, found the FBI at his door. Shadowhawk had managed to break into AT&T's big computers at Bell Labs in New Jersey and allegedly downloaded about a million dollars worth of software. FBI agents confiscated the hacker's equipment, including two Atari computers and, ironically, one AT&T 7300. Well, you've heard of Logo and you've heard of Lego. Now you can buy Logo Lego a new computer-based building block system from the LEGO company. A computer operates devices built with LEGO blocks. The LEGO TC toys will be available this Christmas. The peripheral bargain of the week is PerforRip, a new $10 device from the American Mold Company of Florida. It automatically yanks those annoying perforated edges off your computer printouts. It also doubles as a ruler. At Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, they have trouble getting the computer nerds to show an interest in the school's athletic program. So this past weekend was Disc Day at the CMU Case Western football game. The first 300 students to show up at the game got free Macintosh diskettes. Finally, a New Yorker is using a Macintosh paint program to create new designs for his business, Tattooing. He calls his software Flesh Top Publishing. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 and 2400 baud modems. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Leading Edge, leading the way to the information age. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles cover the latest in microcomputer technology throughout the world. Byte, the international standard.